All right, um, the meeting is being recorded. Um, welcome to week eight of the online lectures. Um, we are on study unit nine, covering the aspect of intention, which is the second form of, of culpability or the second part of the requirement of culpability. Just by way of, of, of um, house, house rules. Um, I trust that we were all able to submit the second assignment. That is the MCQ, which was due yesterday. Um, assignments are very important for, for you to work on because they contribute to your semester mark. So it is very important that you take the, the working of assignments or working through assignments as a serious form of, of exercise. Um, the, with regards to the ECP students or the students that have been identified for the early completion program, please be on the lookout on your site um, for announcement as to the form of your examination. We will um, upload um, revision exercises or um, examples at least for you to 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 prepare yourself or prepare your mind as to the type of exams or format of the exams that you will face. I can tell you that um, your exams will be exclusively multiple choice for CRW 2601 and your paper is scheduled for the 5th of July. I trust that by now you have received notification of that. Um, but otherwise, um, bear in mind that your exam, which is exclusively and wholly multiple choice based, will be on the 5th of July 2021. But we will post um, examples just to um, familiarize yourself and to prepare your mind as to the type of multiple choice questions that you will face. With that in mind and out of the way, let's get on to the content. We are on page 124 of your study guide, um, study unit 9, intention 1. But as always, let us firstly recap what we have gone through. We have um, done chapters one and two on the first week, which was on 28th of April. From the beginning of May, we did um, the act and omissions, which is study unit three. And then the following week, we did study unit four, which is definition elements and causation. The following week, we did study unit five, which was an introduction to unlawfulness. And then thereafter, unlawfulness two, the following week on week six. Um, week seven, we started um, culpability and did, um, the, did the concept of culpability and did criminal capacity. Oh, sorry, um, week, week, um, week five, we did unlawfulness two. Week six, we introduced culpability. Sorry about that. Week six, we introduced culpability and did um, criminal capacity and did non-pathological criminal incapacity. And then on week seven, we went on to do what we did last week, which is mental illness and youth. This is, this is what we recapped basically last week. Um, we did mental illness and youth. We spoke about the concept of mental illness and distinguished it from mental defect. We introduced the two legs of mental illness, which is a pathological leg and a psychological leg. We also, um, I also took you through examples of cases um, that explained what each of those components were. The most important aspect to take from last week's lecture or the session is that um, the proof of mental illness alone I will repeat that because there was a background noise. 
um, the proof of mental illness on its own will not um, lead to um, X not being criminally responsible. It must be proved that the mental illness affected one of the psychological legs that um, form part of criminal capacity. And then we went on to discuss the onus of proof and the verdict. And then afterwards, we also covered youth, which is regulated by the Criminal Justice Act. And we spoke about the, the difference between a child under the age of 10 years of age, um, where the presumption of incapacity is irrebuttable. That means that the state cannot present any evidence to try and dislodge that presumption that the child does not have criminal capacity. But if the child is 10 years and 14 years or between 10 and 14 years of age in committing the offense, the presumption of incapacity is rebuttable, meaning that the state is able to produce evidence to demonstrate that that child particularly um, was able to appreciate the wrongfulness of their act and to act accordingly. That was last week. Now we are dealing with intention and intention, just like criminal capacity, actually has two legs as well, regardless of how it is defined. We will introduce you to the different forms of intention but regardless of the definitions of each form of intention, there are two legs to it, a cognitive and a cognitive leg. We will go further to, 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 to present uh, or to talk about how you prove intention, that is the test itself, and um, the, the 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 component of of intention that extends to all the elements of liability. Now, on page twenty five one twenty five of your guide, we we give you the learning outcomes. When you have finished this unit, we will expect you to understand the requirement of intention by outlining the two elements of intention inherent on its different forms, by determining whether an accused has acted with direct intention or dolus directus, indirect intention or dolus indirectus, or dolus eventualis, and also distinction between motive and intention. Now, when we get to 9.2, which is where we are, we introduced the, the two elements or two components of intention. That means irrespective of, of the form of intention, irrespective of whether it's dolus directus or dolus indirectus or dolus eventualis, each of those forms have two components to it. That is the understanding of intention. And that definition is on page 126 and it's in gray block, gray shaded block. A person acts or causes a result intentionally if firstly he wills the act or result. In other words, he puts what he apprehended and what he foresaw into action. In the knowledge, that is the second leg, of what he is doing, meaning the act, in the knowledge again that the act and circumstances surrounding it accord with the different elements, and in the knowledge as well that it is unlawful. You can actually, if you want, and if it's if it's easier for you to remember this component, um, substitute the word knowledge for awareness. This simply means that, in other words, an accused who commits an unlawful act must commit it with a certain state of awareness. He must be aware of the nature of the act that he is doing. 
he must be aware that the act um, complies with the, the, the description in the definition, definitional elements of that crime. He must also be aware that he or she is acting unlawfully. We will come back to this understanding of awareness because this, this, this is the basis on which you will understand study unit 10 and the concept of mistake. You will not understand mistake under unit 10 uh, unless you understand this particular portion that intention or awareness needs to extend to certain requirements that are part of the crime concerned. So in short, defined more concisely, we can say that intention is to know or to be aware and to will the act or the result. Now, you will see that we, in the definition, we, we say act or result. That is, um, that is not a that is not a coincidence. Uh, when we say act, we are talking about a formally defined crime. And when we talk about result, we are talking about a materially defined crime. Now you remember those concepts when we spoke about the def definitional elements under study unit four. Study unit 4, we introduced the concept of de definition elements and we said that this is the particular description in the definition of a crime that speaks to what the act requirement of X must satisfy. So, for example, for murder the, and couple homicide, the definition elements of those two crimes are the same. It is the causing of death of another human being. For rape, the def definitional element of rape is act of sexual penetration with another without consent. You will immediately realize that the definitional elements of a crime are the portion in the definition that remains when you remove the words unlawful and intentional. So if you remove the words unlawful and intentional or unlawful and negligent, supposing that is culpable homicide, what remains afterwards is the def definitional elements of that crime concerned. So, and we said by way of recap that if you look at the definitional elements of your crimes, some are formally defined, meaning that they, what is prohibited is the act that is performed, which is the committing a, an act of sexual penetration without consent um, in the case of rape, or which is being in possession of a dependence producing substance in the case of possession of drugs. So the act is what is prohibited, irrespective of the result that flows from that act. That is formally defined crimes. For materially defined crimes or consequence crimes, what we prohibit or what the law prohibits is the result. So when we, when we use the word act or result in this unit as you go along, bear in mind that that is consciously done because when we talk about act, we're talking about a formally defined crime. And when we talk about result, we're talking about a materially defined crime. Moving right along then, I have to stress that you need to know the definitions of the different forms of intention. You need to be able to know them to the extent of actually reproducing them if you're asked to give them back to us in the exam. And you also need to know them to the extent of being able to apply them if you're given a factual scenario that requires you to apply them. 
Now, if a, a crime requires intention as a form of culpability, then it does not matter whether the intention is proved as direct intention, indirect intention, or dolus eventualis. Any form of intention that is established will be sufficient. So there are no crimes, for example, that specifically require direct intention, whereas other crimes require dolus eventualis. As long as a crime requires intention, it does not matter which form is proved. Let us start first with the concept of direct intention. A person acts with direct intention if the causing of the forbidden result is his or her aim or goal. Now, immediately I want to make a distinction between um, intention and motive at this stage. I want to make it clear to you that when we speak of intention, we are talking about consequences that are, foresee that, that are foreseen. So we're not talking about a, a person's desire, what the person desired, what the person wanted, what pushed that person to do what they did. That is motive. We are only concerned about the consequences that are foreseen or the consequences that can be expected from an outcome. Now, so as, as I said, dolus directus is if a person has as the, the forbidden result is the main aim or goal. Now, let me stress something here in the, for the purpose of um, outlining each form of intention, we are focusing on materially defined crimes. So that's why you see the word result. So please note that if a crime is a formally defined crime, we will be, we will be using the same concepts, but in reference to an act, not in reference to a result. So the fact that we're using words result, 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 as you see on the slide before you, means that for the purpose of simply explaining each of these concepts, we are focusing on material defined crimes. So with Dolores Directors, um, the example given to you is X wants to kill Y, X takes his revolver, presses it against Y's head, and pulls the trigger. The shot goes, goes off and strikes Y, and Y dies instantly. Then we can say, given that set of circumstances given to you, you can say that X had direct intention to kill Y because killing Y was his main aim or goal. With indirect intention, a person acts with indirect intention or dolus indirectus if the causing of the forbidden result is not his main aim or goal, but he realizes that in achieving his main aim, his conduct will necessarily cause the result in question. Now, to help you understand the distinction, you must focus on the word necessarily or will Probably. This means that in order for X to achieve their main aim or goal, the other result that was not his main aim or goal has to necessarily occur. So this would happen, for example, in the examples given to you, which is the clearest example where X shoots a target, shoots, shoots at, at, at a target through a glass window. His main aim or goal is to hit the target, but he realized that by doing this, he must necessarily also shatter the window. Now, if that happens, X will be charged with two crimes. He will be charged with murder in respect of hitting the target. We, we, we would assume for the purpose of this example that it's a person. 
he will be charged with murder and he will be charged with malicious, mal malicious damage to property in respect of the shattered window. Now, both of those crimes require proof of intention. But the forms of intention in each case are different. In the case of murder, we can establish that that was his main aim or goal. Hence, he had direct intention to commit murder. That's indisputable. Now, the question is, in the case of malicious damage to property, which is another crime and another charge requiring intention, what is the form of intention in that instance? The form of intention, I put it to you, is indirect because he foresaw the shattering of the window as a necessary consequence flowing from the pursuit of his main aim, which was to hit the target. So in the case of malicious injury to property, his form of intention would be indirect. The other example is provided, for example, in the case of Kiwaram, um, which we refer to you basically there. Um, in that case, um, X had particular merchandise which was insured in, a, in the store of a building owned by Y. Now, the aim of X was to claim insurance um, a, as a consequence of damaging damage to that property. So he burnt the the the, the merchandise. He put he burnt the merchant merchandise, uh, which is in that store. But consequentially, consequentially, he also foresaw that the building itself will also be burnt down from that. So now we also have two charges that arise in that instance. In relation to the burning of the merchandise or the stuff that's in the store, he will be charged with malicious damage to property. In relation to the burning down of the building, he'll be charged with arson. And the question now is, in relation to each of those, what is the form of intention that X acted under. In relation to the to the uh, burning down of the of the merchandise or the, the destruction of the merchandise by fire, his intention was direct intention because that was his main aim or goal. However, in relation to the to arson, we cannot say that that was his main aim or goal, but he did foresee that in pursuing his main aim or goal, which is the burning of the merchandise, the burning of the how of, of the structure or the building is a necessary consequence flowing from the pursuit of his main aim. So in relation to that charge, the form of intention will be indirect. Let us look at Dolus Eventualis then. With Dolus Eventualis, it is important to note that a person acts with Dolus Eventualis if the causing of the forbidden result is not his main aim, but he subjectively foresees the possibility that in striving towards the main aim, his conduct may cause the forbidden result and he reconciles himself to this possibility. As you can see, Dolus Eventualis um, does clearly establish the two legs that we talk about. So part one of the definition is the cognitive part or the knowledge part. And part two of that, of that definition is the cognitive part um, or the willing aspect of it. Um, but that does not mean that those two components are not there in the other forms. So, for example, with indirect intention, the, the, it's clear that the person has an awareness uh, and realizes that a certain consequence will take place necessarily and still proceeds. And then with um, direct intention, it's his main aim and goal, and he, pers he pursued that. So, in other words, it was not a case of X just thinking about it or apprehending it 
ex actually put his thoughts in motion. Now, Dolis Evangelis is the most common form of intention that we we focus on. Um, it is it is the, the it is the one that is regularly applied in our courts. In other words, um, it is the 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 the, the catch-all form of intention. If if the accused escapes by virtue of not having Dolis Eventualis, it means that the accused does not have intention. So by degree of, shall I say, um, um, by degree of probability, um, Dolus Directus is at the highest, Dolus Indirectus being at the middle, and Dolus Eventualis being the, 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 the last catch-all uh, point, whereby if the accused escapes, Dolus eventualis, it cannot be said that he had intention. Now, um, for the purpose of this discussion, um, please uh, note that the, the notes will always be provided on my UNISA afterwards. Um, so let me return back here and stay and, and stay on that screen for now. But I would urge you to listen to 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 to, to um, the presentation in the meantime and not focus too much on the screen unless I refer you to it. Now, there are examples that we then give to you of dollars eventualis on page one twenty eight and one twenty nine. Um, the key words in dollars eventualis are foresees the possibility and reconciles. You need to be able to apply um, dollars eventualis by utilizing those words. And we look for those words for the purpose of assessing you as to whether you understand what dollars eventualis requires. That will apply to all the other forms of intention. For, for dollars directors, the key word is aim or goal. For dollars indirectors, it would be not main aim, but necessarily follows or necessarily cause the result. For dollars eventualis, it is not main aim, but foresees possibility and reconciles. So make sure that if you are to apply any of those forms, you are utilizing the, the, the key words of each of those definitions. Now, um, please look at the particular examples and you will see that at every point of the examples that we give you, we utilize those words. Foresees, possibility, reconciles. Now, there are interesting cases that then come up um, that have come up in our courts. Um, there are three cases that I want to just um, discuss with you. Um, those are the case of Humphreys, 2013-2, uh, SACR 1, a decision of the Supreme Court of Appeal. There is the case of S versus Nglansi, 2014-2, SACR 256, a decision again of the Supreme Court of Appeal. Then there is the case of S versus Marohani or Jup Jup. And another, 2015 1 SACR 337, a decision of the South High Houting High Court. Um, the, la the last two cases are in your tutorial letter 102. Please bear in mind that tutorial letter 102 is part of your study material. You need to study the, the information that relates to content that are in tutorial letter 102, just as much as you study the content that is in the study guide. Um, that is as equally examinable as the stuff that are contained in the study guide. Now, Humphreys is the one that really set the ball rolling um, as to 
the controversy around dollars eventualis, especially in the case of road traffic accidents. It seems that the courts um, have a reluctance to actually convict uh, motor vehicle drivers of murder when it comes to uh, road accident cases that results in somebody dying. And this can be traced back to the Humphreys decision whereby we have a mini taxi driver who had 14 school children in the minibus. The taxi driver who is based in Belleville in Cape Town had managed on two occasions to bypass a boom gate that um, meant to regulate the, 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 the passing of a train. So, for example, there, there, there's a boom gate that um, when it when it goes down, the lights start flashing to indicate that a train is coming and then cars have to stop to ensure that they don't um, they, 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 they don't pass while the train is passing. But this taxi driver managed on two occasions, despite the flashing of those lights, to cross over the, 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 the rail, the railway road, whilst the train was minutes away from actually crossing. So in this instance, unfortunately, his gamble did not pay off. And 14 of the 14 children, 10 of them died. And four were seriously injured. So he faced 10 counts of murder and four counts of attempted murder for his actions. He was convicted of all those counts in the trial court and the matter went up to the Supreme Court of Appeal. In the Supreme Court of Appeal, his defense was that he did not have intention to commit murder. And so in that case, the Supreme Court of Appeal looked at the two legs of Dolores Eventualis. They held that the accused did subjectively foresee the possibility of, of, of death ensuing for his from his conduct. But they held that he did not reconcile himself with, with the, the, the possibility of death occurring. And the court went into great lengths to try and define this second component of dolus eventualis. It went on to say that this component means that the accused must consent to the consequence. The accused must take it into the bargain that the consequence will happen or may happen because it's a possibility. So he must take into the bargain that the consequence may happen. If that cannot be the only inference to be drawn. So for example, if there's any reasonable possibility of an inference that can be drawn that he believed that it will not happen, then that second leg did not happen, would, would not be satisfied. Um, and on that basis, the court reasoned rather controversially, in my opinion, that the accused did not reconcile himself with the possibility of death occurring because firstly, he would have had to reconcile with the possibility of him dying. Um, since he could not and did not reconcile himself with him dying, it is unlikely that he foresaw the possibility of the passengers in the vehicle dying from his conduct. Then the court also justified its conclusion by saying that the accused did not reconcile with the possibility because he had managed on two occasions to successfully bypass the, 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 the boom gates without any injuries or any consequence. So on that basis, he believed or he, 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 there was, it was inferred by the court that 
he believed that it not happen. He believed that it the 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 deaths will not happen of his passengers. So on those two evidential considerations, the court said the second leg was not complied with. I would say that in my view, and this is my personal view, um, in fact, I would go as far as to say that I encourage you to go read those cases, the three cases um, concerned, the, the Humphreys, then Glanzi, and the Maruhanye. Um, read them from the from the case from from the um, law reports. I would really encourage you to do that for yourself and to to come up with your own reflections on 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 those matters. But speaking um, just personally, um, I, I find the the reasoning in Humphreys rather problematic, especially um, the aspect of saying that you can't find that somebody took on the basis of saying that the accused did not foresee himself dying or did not reconcile himself with himself dying. Um, on that basis, you can just simply go further and say that therefore the accused did not reconcile himself with the possibility of his passengers dying. It has never been a situation um, when it comes to Doris Eventualis whereby we, we, we determine his, his, his reconciliation on the basis of him see, himself dying, because it's always a question of what about the other people? In other words, murder is about the causing of death of other people or another human being. It's not about the causing of death of the accused. If the accused were to foresee himself die, that would not be murder. That would be suicide, which is not a crime. But that's the interesting dynamic, in my view, about Humphreys. But then we go further and we have the case of Ndlanzi. In the case of Ndlanzi, we have a taxi driver once again. In those of you who have been in Joburg and know how busy Bree Street is, you know, like, like how, how, how busy that rank is, um, you have a situation whereby this taxi driver goes onto the pavement, knocks a pedestrian down, um, hits the stop sign, and, and a newspaper stall. And then afterwards, reverses back and rides on top of the, 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 the injured pedestrian on the floor, and by virtue of that, the pedestrian dies. Now, it was presented in court once again. He was charged with murder, among other crimes, other road traffic offenses. And in the instance of the murder charge, his argument was that he did not have dolus eventualis. The court once again said, well, he did subjectively foresee the possibility of death occurring but he did not reconcile himself with the, 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 the possibility of, 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 of that occurring. In other words, he did not take it into the bargain that he, 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 he could knock somebody, somebody down and um, not be guilty. So on the basis of that, the court said that um, there was no dollars eventualis, and instead, he was found to have acted negligently and um, a conviction of culpable homicide followed from that. But the disturbing thing about these cases um, is that there seems to be an objective approach to determining what the accused should have foreseen subjectively. So the more you read the reasoning of, 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 of these, these courts or these forums, you actually do realize that there is an element in which they reason or, they, or, or, or there's a seeping in of an objective assessment to intention, which, is, which should not happen. Um, as we will cover later on, the test for intention is subjective. We are not concerned with what 
um, a normal person in the circumstances of the accused should have foreseen and should have reconciled with. We are concerned with what did X actually foresee um, as the result occurring. Now, um, uh, the, the reality is that in determining that or in drawing that inference, um, you, the, the courts have to start from um, a level of objective probability of, 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 of what was possibly foreseeable. And then the court afterwards, judging by the facts that they have established, they have to place themselves in the position of the accused and say, what did the accused actually or in actual fa fact foresee as a possibility? Can we draw the, a, 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 the inference with reasonable certainty or a degree of reasonableness and say that X did in actual fact subjectively foresee this happening and X did subjectively take it into the bargain and, and accept that this possibility may happen and proceeded regardless. Now, the controversies of these cases were further compounded in the case of State versus Marohanye, um, or the Jube Jube case, which happened in around 20, 2010. In that instance, um, um, Jube Jube and uh, Temba Chabalala drove their Mini Cooper cars. They were speed racing on Mdalose Street in Soweto. And while speed racing, um, the one overtaking the other and so on, one of the cars, one of the drivers lost control, um, bumped the other Mini Cooper car, and in the bump, the friction caused, caused the two cars to 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 get out of the out of uh, uh, to to be uh, unbalanced and to and unfortunately what happened is that they 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 they, they went into a couple of school kids and four of them died and two of them were severely injured so there was a charge of murder for the four school kids and in relation to the two it was attempted murder. It was discovered that um, Jup Jup and his co-accused had taken drugs, um, cocaine in particular. Um, this was discovered from their urine samples. And um, the trial court in that instance, despite that evidence, and despite also holding that the, 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 the intake of drugs caused them to have an, an exuberant or an, an, an overconfident um, disposition. Despite that evidence, the court held that they still had dollars eventualized. They still subjectively foresaw the possibility that in their conduct, they may cause the death of other people and they reconcile themselves with that in doing that. So. They were convicted in the magistrate court and then the matter went on appeal. They appealed to the high court against their conviction and sentence. At the time, their sentence, I think, was 20, 20 years or 25 years. Um, and their defense basically was to say that they did not have intention. The court following the case of Humphreys said that um, indeed um, they foresaw the possibility of um, death occurring from their behavior, but they did not reconcile themselves with that possibility because of the intake of the intake of the of, of the cocaine um, had caused them to believe that um, it would not happen. So on that basis, the, the, the court um, found them not guilty of murder uh, amongst other charges. 
and convicted them of carbon homicide along with other um, charges or road traffic offenses and they served a sentence of eight years. Now, as I said, I would really encourage you to, to go through each of those cases. Um, just, in fact, I would, be, one of the reasons why I, I, I would encourage you to read them is not necessarily for the point of view that I've, I'm communicating to you, but because in those cases, you can also see the principles. A lot of the principles that that, that, that we've covered already, you know, um, are discussed there. There's in the Humphreys case, for example, there's a, a discussion about um, voluntary conduct and um, the 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 the, um, the test to prove um, whether whether an accused acted with sane automatism. Um, there's 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 clearly reference as well to to criminal capacity and the test and the approaches there as well so so it, it will not only be beneficial for you to understand how the principles of dolis eventualis were communicated in th in that case you will also see how the courts reason and how the courts apply the principles in other uh, elements of liability um, so we are now on page 131 of your study guide um, as i indicated um, the test for intention is subjective. The court has to place itself in the position of the accused and based on the evidence that it has established and satisfied itself with, it has to draw a, an inference of what the accused actually subjectively foresaw as a possibility. Now, in, in reasoning such, in such a manner, the court is not allowed to make statements like he should have foreseen the result or he ought to have foreseen the result. That is amounts to importing an objective test to the test for, for, for intention, which is subjective. In other words, once you say X should have foreseen or X ought to have foreseen, what you're actually doing is that you're comparing X's state of mind to that of another person, i.e. a reasonable person in the same position. You can't make that. That, 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 that is importing an objective um, approach to determining what should actually be a subjective test. Now, obviously, how do we prove intention then, or how do, does the court prove intention? As I have explained briefly to you, but it's elaborated more on page 131. Um, obviously, it does not happen that the, that, that the accused people just admit the element of intention. It's usually a requirement that the courts have to uh, establish as a fact. So what do they do? The, 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 the evidence is obviously established from the, the testimonies of various witnesses and compiled together. And, and from, from there, the court is able to make an assessment of what the facts of the case were. It will say, these are the facts and give those facts. And then thereafter, on the basis of those facts now, the court has to place itself in the position of the accused under those circumstances, given the accused also uh, predisposition, predispo you know, is the accused an erratic person? Is the accused um, someone who is um, low, has low degree of intelligence, um, his age, um, his possible insecurities and everything that is subjective about that accused or that applies particularly to that accused, and it has to make the inference. What did the accused actually foresee? And did the accused reconcile himself with what he foresaw? That is how the, 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 the inference ought to be drawn. Now, we move along. We are on page 132 now um, of the unit. We're covering an aspect which I will elaborate more 
on when we start unit 10 dealing with mistake. But as we introduced, as we introduced, uh, and I'm going back on the slides to that portion that I'm talking about. Intention has got two components, a knowledge or awareness and a willing. And if you go back to page 126 to that shaded block, you will see that the awareness component has to extend to certain elements in the definition of the crime. So in other words, X must be aware that the nature of the act is the one that is prohibited in the definition of the crime. X must be aware that the circumstances that, 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 that he acted under are those that are proscribed within the definition elements of the crime concerned. X must also be aware that he, is, he or she is acting unlawfully or without a ground of justification. And if X is unaware of any of those, he acts under mistake or a misapprehension of certain circumstances. And such a mistake can be material and exclude his intention. But we will cover those when we deal with the aspect of mistake. But before we get there, to conclude this particular portion, let us now talk about, um, remember I said to you that um, there are formally defined crimes and there are materially defined crimes. With formally defined crimes, the awareness must also extend to the nature of the act. So in other words, X must be aware in the case of rape that he's performing an act of sexual penetration. If X is unaware of that, then X operates under a mistake. In the case of possession of drugs, X must be aware that what is in possession and what he or she is in possession is a drug. If X thinks that maybe he's in possession of talcum powder or bicarbonate of soda, that's not a drug um, for the purpose of, 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 of this crime. So X would lack intention for the purpose of the, of the crime of possession of drugs. In the case of perjury, for example, perjury or common law perjury, X must be aware that he's making a declaration that is false. If, for example, X does not believe that the declaration that that he or she is making is a false declaration that is a material error that, that affords X a, 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 an escape in terms of lacking intention. X must also be aware that he's making that um, false declaration under oath. If, there was, if, if he's unaware that he's making it under oath, then it does not comply with um, common law per perjury and he would lack intention. X must be aware, for example, that he is making those in the course of a legal proceeding. In other words, in court. If X, for example, thinks that he's in an, administ an administrative proceeding, you know, maybe a, a, a liquidation um, proceeding that's taking place under the Insolvency Act, um, then, or, 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 just to make it very clear, a commission of inquiry. A commission of inquiry does not constitute a legal proceeding within the definition of what a legal proceeding is for the purpose of common law perjury. X may be guilty of statutory perjury, but that's something else. But common law perjury must take place in a courtroom situation. So if X, for example, is making such declarations in a proceeding that is not a legal proceeding, then um, his awareness does not extend to an important component in the definition of that crime, and therefore he would lack 
intention. That is, those are examples, all those three examples um, are examples whereby in the case of rape, in the case of um, possession of drugs, in the case of um, common law perjury, um, those are, are, are formally defined crimes. And if you look at your specific offenses um, section, those of you are doing uh, criminal, law, criminal law specific offenses, you can take any crime um, and, and reflect on that. Theft, for example, theft is a, is a formally defined crime as well. So, so, so obviously it is important that X must be aware that the property, for example, that, 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 um, that, that, that he's alleged to have stolen is capable of being stolen. Uh, X must be aware that the property concerned, for example, does not belong to him. Um, if he thinks he's taking his own property, then he's, he's unaware of a very important component that is in the definition of, of theft. And, and that would afford him a defense excluding intention. So I trust that you can see how, how these things overlap um, as far as the two, the, 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 the two modules come in and how important it is that you understand the concept of intention and negligence um, from this unit in particular so that you are able to apply um, the, 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 those principles even in your specific offense um, matters. So that brings us ultimately to the conclusion of um, this unit. As, as you can see, uh, 133 speaks of intention directed to the circumstances in the different elements as, as I've explained to you. Um, and then in 134, we speak of intention ex extending to unlawfulness. Now, if, for example, X thinks that he or she acts in private defense or has a ground of justification that excludes their unlawfulness, then in that case, for example, they are acting in putative private defense or putative necessity, or there is putative consent to, to, to an instance of rape. For example, X thinks that Y actually gave consent and, and that, that belief is actually held honestly um, in that instance, then X would lack intention to commit rape because he, his intention would not extend to the element of without consent. And furthermore, it would not extend to the unlawfulness component. So that is, um, those are the examples of the intention component having to extend to each of the relevant elements contained in the definition of the crime concerned. Um, I will come back to this when we deal with mistake. Uh, the next unit, uh, so unit nine is foundational to understanding the contents of unit 10. Um, let me conclude by talking about the distinction between motive and intention. As I said earlier, um, the reasons or the motivations that gave rise to X's conduct or behavior are irrelevant to the consideration of intention. There's an interesting case um, called Piveret, 1940 AD 213. Now I'm, I'm going to share it with you. X and Y um, wanted to commit suicide. So they are, they are, the manner in which they agreed to commit suicide is that um, they, they would be in the car and they would um, inhale carbon monoxide from the exhaust of that car. So there was a, a, a tube or a pipe that was put on the exhaust of the, of the car and then the, the, the other end was um, put in through the, through the window and, and closed as the car was motoring on. So they, they inhaled that carbon monoxide from the exhaust of the car, but the, 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 the intended deaths did not take place because both of them survived. Now, 
X, who was the owner of the car, was then charged with the attempted murder of, of Y, who was part of the, uh, uh, was in the car with X. And it was established that, of course, X did not, did not desire that Y die. Um, the court accepted that. But the court said that, that, is, that, that, that X's desire um, is irrelevant to the issue of intention because what we are concerned about, as I said earlier, are the consequences of the conduct. What is the natural consequences that are foreseeable? Um, that, it, that, that consideration can be determined without any reflection on um, the motivations that gave rise to why X did what they did. In the case of Hartman, for example, um, a, a case of mercy killing, um, X is a medical uh, practitioner. His dad had um, severe cancer and there was no chance of, 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 of his dad surviving. Um, and, and the court accepted that X was really conflicted because on the one hand, he's a medical practitioner who's, who's given his oath to saving lives. But on the other hand, he's seeing his father, who's his patient, suffering, and he wants to, he, he wants to unburden his suffering. He wants to relieve him of the suffering that he's under. So he injected pentothal um, through the drip, and um, within within minutes, um, um, his father died from that. He was charged with murder, um, and the court still found him guilty of murder, um, but um, took his motivations um, as a mitigating factor in the case of the punishment and um, he, he did not serve any jail time. His punishment was wholly suspended. So that's, that's the, the, the difference there is that although X's motivations was to alleviate um, the pain and suffering that his dad was under, um, he still um, consequentially, the consequences of his actions were, were clearly foreseeable. You know, it was, uh, he had intention to, to, to end his father's life. So in that instance, he is guilty, he was guilty of murder. That brings us to the end of the unit. Um, as I have said, the, the slides will be available on uh, my UNISA as well as this recording. Um, let me, take down the, 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 the slides and view the, the questions that are available to answer. Can you just give me a minute? Okay, let me take um, Lituma Bosaleti. Can you unmute your mic? Hello. Yes, uh, good af afternoon, Mr. Ramazan. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I just want to get clarity a little bit on uh, when you have to reconcile yourself, when you did. Uh, Example with a uh, juke That's why I'm a little bit uh, con uh, co uh, confused uh, on that element of when you have to reconcile yourself. Is that uh, do you have to foresee the act, then reconcile yourself so that we are not charged? Or you said, because on the issue of uh, uh, juke they took the, the drugs, but then they didn't recon reconcile themselves. So it's like they, they somehow that's why that's why that's why 
their charge was uh, reduced to culpable to culpable homicide. So it is it's not clear to me that part of 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 the concern thing from those examples that you made. I'm just a little bit uh, uh, confused there. Yeah. I'm not sure you understood you understood me. Oh, all right, no, I, I completely understood you. Can I can I ask you just for the purpose of answering? Yeah, thank you for 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 muting your mic again. Um, the element of reconciliation was um, refined in the case of Humphreys. Um, if you read the discussion of Humphreys in this in the in the study guide, um, you, it is discussed in detail on page one twenty nine and one thirty. Uh, you will notice what the court said about the the, the reconciliation part of Dolores Eventualis. Um, the court said that the accused has to consent to the consequence happening, or the accused has to take it into the bargain um, that this may happen um, in his conduct. Um, if there is no possibility or if or, or if the only inference that can be drawn is that X believed that it would not happen, then it means that the accused did not reconcile to the possibility of that consequence happening. Is that clear? Uh, yes, yes. OK, no, I understand now. I think it's clear. OK, no, thanks. Thanks. Um, let me take uh, Nkosana Kuluva. Uh, Nkosana, may you, may you kindly unmute your mic? Uh, Nkosana, your hand is recognized. May you kindly unmute your mic? Okay, while, while, while we are waiting for Nkosana, um, and Nkosana, please note that you're, you, you are still in a position to unmute your mic. Um, if at any point you are able to do that, um, I will recognize you. Um, let me proceed to, 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 to Zanele, Patricia. Hello, Good Zanele. Afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon, Professor Musa, and the rest of the, of the students. Um, I want clarity on um, on the exam. You said that the exam are uh, next month, basically. So um, I was just concerned because some of us haven't received our timetable. So I wanted to ask about that. Oh, OK. Um, all right. Um, OK. <laughs> yes. Um, if, if you have been identified as an early completion program student, in other words, there are students among us who have been afforded an opportunity to actually complete their qualifications at the end of July, um, if, they, if they meet certain criteria or requirements. Now, um, those students have been identified um, as ECP or early completion program students and their exams will be take place from the 28th of June until the 15th of July. Um, so I, I understand that CRW 2601, that exam will take place on the 5th of July, the 5th of July, 5th July. Um, so if you haven't received your timetable yet, um, you will have to get that from, from the university. But um, I'm giving you a heads up already that um, the date for the ECP CRW2601 exam is the 5th of July. Uh, oh, basically, it, basically, is it for everyone? Because we assume that uh, some of us will be writing in December or November. So I just wanted to confirm whether all of us will be included in the exam, just to prepare for the sake of writing the exam. 
if you are not identified as an early completion um, student, um, you will not be writing the exam for June, July. You will actually be eligible for the end of year exam. Um, thank you, Professor. That is clear. Um, that's a pleasure. Thank you, Patricia. Can you can you mute your mic, please? Thank you. Um, let me invite um, Ndaleni Kauli. Okay. Uh, okay. Afternoon, Prof. Afternoon. Okay. You know what? I have a challenge. A little a, a challenge with the Humphrey case because. Well, when I went, uh, when I go through the case and the reasons that were stated, uh, there is something that I don't understand because Humphrey knew that what he was doing, it could cause death. I mean, going when you try to cause and you know that the train is coming, I mean, you can cause death. And that would mean that if he was sure that in case an accident occurs, he was going to die and the people... He was going to be involved in an accident himself and the passengers. But the reasons that were that were given that, well, he did it twice and managed. Uh, I'm, I don't think the, I mean, I, I, the, the, it's something that I don't understand because what he was doing, it was wrong and he knew that it could cause death. It's just that he had escaped in the past. So can you clarify me on that one? Because uh, the reasons that were given are, uh, uh, with that judgment, I, I, I'm struggling to understand. Um, on a personal level, I would say join the club, Ndaleni. Um, I, I also don't quite uh, align myself with the reasons given. Um, you will recall that the reasons given were that, um, firstly, in order for Humphreys to have reconciled himself with the possibility that the students or the passengers would die or may die from his conduct, he would have had to also reconcile himself with the possibility of himself dying. Now, um, the court then went on to say that because he did not reconcile himself with the possibility of himself dying, um, it naturally led to the conclusion that he did not reconcile himself with the possibility of the passengers dying. Um, my concern with that reasoning is that um, it has never been necessary for a charge of murder that you foresee your own death and reconcile with your own death. Uh, murder is defined as the causing of death of another human being. Um, so it should not matter um, for for the finding for you to be able to find that the human being may have died. It is not necessary that that be linked to 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 you for seeing yourself dying. Um, that's that, that's my concern with that reasoning. Um, and then obviously the court also said that because Humphreys had managed to successfully uh, escape being hit by a train on two occasions, performing the same maneuver. That led to the inference that he subjectively believed that he would not cause a collision. And on that basis, um, he did not reconcile himself according to the court. Is that clear? Yes, yeah, I understand. Okay, let me take um, Dabane Absalom. Afternoon, Prof. Afternoon, Dabane. Uh, Prof, I've got uh, two questions, in fact. Yes, go for it. There is some way I read where... Uh, I think it was a, a common law presumption that says law is a subjective discipline. And today you touched on subjective things. Where do we get that? Why is it so? Uh, 
Um, can you mute your mic, please? Um, thanks, Tabani. Um, all right, I, 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 I don't want to be general in terms of responding to your your question. Um, when what the context was when 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 you heard that law is a subjective thing. Um, the emphasis that I want to focus on here for the purpose of the lecture is that when one determines the presence of intention. So before one concludes that X acted with intention, um, the investigation into the presence of intention is subjective. And that simply means that you, the court must reach a conclusion that X did subjectively foresee um, certain circumstances or certain results occurring. So in order for the court to, 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 to reach that, it has to place itself in the position of X, given the surrounding circumstances that have been established, and say, all right, um, the X, X would have foreseen this, therefore X did actually foresee this happening. So, so, so there's a process whereby it starts from from saying, if if, if I place myself in the position of X, um, I would have or may have, as a possibility, foreseen this in that situation, given the circumstances. Therefore, X did actually foresee this as a possibility. I hope I'm clear with with that one. At least, at least I'm getting someone. The second one uh, uh, on dollars eventualis, where one has to reconcile with a possibility of, of something. Is it always obvious that we all going to reconcile ourselves with a single, maybe, idea? Say, in the case of an accident, and, and I'm not a... A, a, a professional uh, a, a medical practitioner, and I take over uh, the, uh, uh, the situation, I become in charge, and, and I reconcile with, 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 with the fact that I'm going to make the, 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 the people that uh, um, encountered the accident survive and live, and they happen to die. Is, is it possible that one can have a, can reconcile differently with other people's opinions. Um, please mute. OK, thank you. Um, all right. Before you can come to the question of reconciling, uh, there has to be foresight of a possibility. Um, so I like the question that you ask because um, even when you read the Marohanya judgment, um, the, the, the court was at pains to, to say if the degree of foresight, in other words, if, 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 if the possibility foreseen, you know, um, was, was reasonable or, or at least, in other words, um, if, it, if, if there was a strong possibility that this was foreseen, you know, in other words, it's not a slight awareness of something, but a strong possibility that it was foreseen. Um, then the, it should follow that if indeed X continued, despite seeing that strong possibility, he or she reconciled with that. So the second leg naturally follows from the degree of foresight that one has, has seen. Um, that has been the, the, the established understanding, at least until, until the case of Humphreys. So what Humphreys has effectively done is that it has made the question of foresight um, redundant, or at least it, what it has done, it has, it has um, uh, killed off the debate of what is the degree of foresight that must be seen. How strong should 
the, the, the possibility be in the eyes of X? Is it a slight one? Is it a, a stronger one? Um, is it a bit more, is the possibility more probable? You know, if, if, if I were to use that um, oxymoron, so to speak, but I hope you understand what I mean. Um, so, 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 so before Humphreys, there was a debate about um, how, 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 how strong should the, the degree of foresight be of the possibility? Um, and, and, and does it matter? Because the, the, reconciliation, the, the reconciliation part was regarded as a given as long as there was a foresight. So now um, with Humphreys, the, what, the, what the courts have done is that they have uh, attempted to add content to the second leg, um, which is, is, is a bit controversial. Um, um, and it has, it has rendered the debate on foresight um, um, controversial as well. Um, so I hope I'm not confusing you in, 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 in what I'm saying, but um, previously before Humphreys, it was more or less a given that if there is foresight of a possibility of this thing happening, the reconciliation is a given. Understood. Thank you, Prof. Okay, I will um, unmute Alice. Um, Alice, you can unmute yourself. Alice Rice-Seja. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, I just wanted to ask in terms of the intention and also the other doulas average, yeah. Uh, in, in the case of um, Oscar Pistorius, I just wanted to find out, you will correct me if I'm wrong, because when I remember, it's like he was charged with capable homicide. Then after that, he was it was converted to murder. I'm not sure, Prof. So I wanted to understand, is it possible for the court to, when the person said, no, I haven't, I wasn't aware, like in the case of Humphrey, I wasn't aware I was going to kill those, uh, like the, the kids, because I didn't reconcile and all that. And then eventually they decide, the court decide to maybe gather information and change the capable homicide maybe to murder, knowing that they will they will give them more years maybe in prison. I just wanted clarity on that. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm putting the question uh, right. Um, Alice, you are you are correct. Um, what had happened in the um, high court um, is that um, Oscar Pistorius was found guilty of culpable homicide because he acted negligently. Um, the court in in the high court um, unfortunately misapplied um, dollars eventualis because instead of saying that Oscar Pistorius um, subjectively foresaw that he may kill another human being. Um, the court placed emphasis to say that Oscar Pistorius did not subjectively foresee that he would kill Riva. So in other words, um, the court, instead of just saying that, did Oscar Pistorius foresee that he would kill another human being who was, or the figure behind that door. The high court placed emphasis in saying, did Oscar Pistorius foresee that he would kill Riva? And on that basis, um, the court misapplied the first leg of Dolores Eventualis. Um, and um, because naturally, um, the conclusion would be that he did not foresee that he would kill Riva. He thought that Riva was still in the bed next to him. Um, so, 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 what then happened is that the the the, the state appealed on a question of law, uh, or took the matter up to the SCA on a question of law, and then um, the SCA entertained the question of law on dollars eventualis, 
and found that the court indeed did misapply Doris Eventualis and substituted the couple homicide finding for, for guilty of murder. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Prof, thank you so much. Um, okay, can I, okay, I, I, I see it's already 28 past, um, and I want to, I want to um, answer as many questions as I can. So I would like your permission. Um, um, and, and, and if it is okay, because I, I still see some hands and I don't want to prejudice um, the hands. I know it's a holiday, but um, can I, um, can I, can, can I, um, for the sake of those people that are having questions to ask, um, can I um, indulge you for an extra um, 20 to 30 minutes? If, if, if that is okay, can you give me by show of hands or um, some indication that it's okay? All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I see those hands. I see those hands. Um, and I, I want to respect those students that um, do want to leave. Um, please feel free to leave if, if, if you so wish to do so. But let me take um, um, the hands that are still there and indulge you guys for at least an extra 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, the next hand that I see is um, uh, Tulani. Uh, Tulani, can you unmute yourself? Tulani, can you unmute yourself? Okay, um, all right, I'll go to Tandiwe. Tandiwe Mazingo. Um. Good evening, Prof. Good day, Tandiwe. Uh, yes, Prof. I would like to ask a question uh, with regards to dollars eventually. So, uh, Prof, I have um, a challenge understanding. So you say that uh, X must foresee the possibility and then must reconcile himself to that possibility. Uh, I have a challenge in understanding the word reconcile. Do you mean do you mean that that X must um, he must believe that the possibility or the outcome will not happen? And then um, I don't I don't actually get it. Can you please try to just explain this uh, reconcile for me? Maybe um, I'll get it right. Okay, Tandiwe, um, it's it's a good question. Um, for that, I would I would encourage you to read the case of Humphreys. Um, on page one thirty of your study guide, that is where the, we discuss what the court um, said about the the reconciliation part. It said that um, to satisfy that element, X must consent to the possibility happening, or X must. Um, take it into the bargain um, that, the, 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 that the, the, the foreseen possibility will occur or the foreseen consequence may occur. Um, that, is, that, that is how the Humphreys um, case defined uh, the concept of reconciliation, that it's X um, consciously or subjectively taking it into the bargain or X consciously, subjectively by his actions, um, consenting, or by and going ahead, re regardless of, of of what he had foreseen. Hope that clear. Okay, Prof. So, uh, if if X uh, consent or believes that uh, the outcome will happen, it means that he reconciles, isn't? Um. Yes. Um. If 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 X. Um, consents in the within the understanding of what the Humphreys case um, stated, what what reconciliation means, then it means that X did reconcile and X did have dollars eventualis. All right, thank you, Prof. I understood. Thank you so much. 
All right, all right. Lamola Tando. Hi, Mr. Ramosa. Hi, hi, Tando. Um, my question might be very sounding very controversial. Now I'm gathering thoughts on Humphrey Humphreys. He has the, this case has killed the degree of foresight, right? And it has set a legal precedent that um, based on, on, on the following cases in Lanzi and Mar Marohani. So now in future, can that um, can the, 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 the degree of foresight be brought back? If should there be a similar case? Because now it's a it's a bit on it's a bit confusing that this part particular uh, stance has been deleted in the in, in, in the legal sphere. Can it be brought back by another case arguing that um, the degree of foresight has to stand? I know my question is very controversial, uh, hence I just need to be balanced. Uh, no, um, it's it, it's a good question. Um, thank you for it. Um, the, 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 uh, as, I, as I said, um, it seems that um, Humphreys, uh, in deciding the way it decided on the reconciliation part, um, minimized the role of foresight, or at least killed off the debate of the degree of foresight. How how strong should it be? Is a slight foresight enough? Um, Humphreys has killed off that debate based on how it defined reconciliation. Um, so I suppose that we have to wait until the SCA finds or engages another uh, motor vehicle accident case um, whereby they they they, they um, review uh, their uh, their interpretation of the two legs of of dollars eventualis. Um, I think that's the, that that's the best that I can I can answer you on that on that question. Sorry, sorry, just to follow up. Can it not be um, taken to a higher court like the constitutional court and challenged there? Well, if the state has money or time. <laughs> Um, no, yes, it, it, it can always go to the higher court. But remember, the the the, the issue is always that um, the case the, a case must go through the court structures. Um, so it's 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 a case of waiting for another similar case um, to go through the court structures and um, be judged by the SCA. And then, you know, um, taken up to the Concord um, to reflect on that. Hope that helps. Thanks, thanks. Um, Paula Skosana, you can unmute your mic. on the distinction between motive and intention. Hello, can you repeat the question? I would like the clarity on the distinction between motive and intention. Oh, okay, um, when we talk about intention, um, the focus is on what is the consequence that is foreseeable. Um, from 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 X's conduct, um, and whether that was either subjectively foreseen when we talk about intention, or is it a consequence that a reasonable person would have foreseen? If we talk about negligence, which we will cover at a later study unit. Um, so the the issue with intention, or or, or, or is about the consequence. Uh, what is the consequence or the likely consequence that flows from excess conduct? It does not matter um, what the motivation uh, with which X acted and performed that conduct comes into play. So the motive with which um, X acted is irrelevant to considering intention. Whether X thought that in killing um, his father or shortening the life of his father 
um, he is uh, relieving him from the pain of suffering under late stage cancer in the case of Hartman, um, or whether X um, thought that, you know, um, they, they, they are relieving their, their family from, from, from pain in this life so that they can, they can be reunited in heaven. Um, that motive is irrelevant um, when considering intention. Prof. Prof is too late. Prof. Oh, okay, Tulane, Tulane, I've got you. Um, yeah, that time I was struggling with unmuting. I, I had to do some settings, but I, I, I succeeded. No, thank you, thank you. Um, you're always welcome to join. Um, can I before before you come? Can I make sure that I have answered uh, the previous oh, yes. students? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, can the previous student confirm whether I I, I assisted uh, with the distinction between motive and intention? Okay, it looks like um, the it student is Kosara. has... It is Kosara, maybe you can shout the name. <laughs> okay, um, all right. Um, okay, um, Tulani, you can, you can go ahead. Um, uh, okay, Prof, um, thank you very much for, for the opportunity and then um, for, for thinking of us, though it's a holiday, for taking your time and try to assist us. Um, I, I'm just making a follow-up based on... Uh, a clarity seeking that came with uh, one of the students during the course of the question and answer session. Um, it was uh, it's based on uh, the students that are uh, that will be selected to write in Ju July. I mean examinations. I just want to check the the, the method of choosing. I mean, like, are you are they are you choosing at random? Are they being chosen at random, or there's a certain uh, eligibility criteria that is being looked before they are being chosen or are those that are doing final year or are left with few modules to complete the degree or what that is the first one the the second one uh, i don't know how best can you assist me but it was supposed to be personal not really uh, personal to that extent i'm just saying it, it does not concern other students because it's 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 for me alone. I've I've just uh, got my my registration finalized. I, I joined the team of registered students later. It, it was early this month because of some financial problems. That's why I'm saying it might be personal. So uh, one assignment has been tab in assign. Uh, there's one assignment which the the, the the submission tab is closed. So. I don't know how personally can you assist me to meet the lecturer and get clarity on what should be done when in, in, in such cases. Thank you, Prof, to, to, to take you to that extent. Okay, now, um, thank you to Lani for your question. Let me answer the, the first question. Um, there are criteria that um, the university um, has given for identifying those students that are eligible or uh, afforded the opportunity under the early completion program. Um, I I can't think of those criteria off the top of my head right now um, I, I, because I might make a mistake um, as to as I might say something that is not correct. Um, but I, but I can I can inform you that if um, if you have not been identified by now. Um, as eligible for the early completion program, uh, eligible to sit for the June, July uh, special exam, then <laughs> you, are, you are not an ECP student um, and you need not worry about, about that. Um, when it comes to the question that you asked, um, please send me an email um, to Lani um, because um, Yes, we, we we deal with such matters on a on a case by case basis. I want okay. to make it I want to make it very clear that um, the purpose of the extension was to cater for students in your position who um, had late registrations because of delays in NSFAS payments. Mm -hmm. uh, so 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 um, it was not meant for those students that want to improve on their assignment content. 
So mm -hmm. for those that have already submitted their assignment content, you are discouraged from trying to 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 resubmit or to send us an email. Um, so hence I say that in your case, Tulani, please send me an email. Um, you can also attach your assignment to me via email and explain the circumstances that you have gone through. But it's not for this module. It's for another one, but it's, yeah, I don't want, I, I, I don't want to disclose the name of the module, but it's, 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 it's the friend of this one. <laughs> It's a friend of this module. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, look, the friend of this module is also more or less subject to the, the principles of this module as well. Mm -hmm. it's, this, it, it, it's, it's the same um, procedure, it's the, the same procedure. OK, it, Prof, last thing, just last thing. If I can get your email address, I don't know the one that you, you prefer. Uh, so that he, it just comes straight to you. We will take it from there without any waste of time. Okay, I'll post it under the chat. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. No, no. Oh, okay. it means I can have a pen and a paper ready to take it. Yeah, post it under the chat. I can't give it to you now. <laughs> oh, I must. Uh... No, 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 hear me out. I'm saying that in the chat, I will write it down for you, Tulani. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, thank you. I can see it's, it's yeah it's going there. I just yeah yeah. All right. Um, oh, I see oh, it. Ho hope you got it. That's, that's yeah. Thank it. you very much. Thank you very much. Don't remove it. Oh, it's gone. No, it's there. Under me, eh? <laughs> no, not under you. On the chat, uh, where everyone can see it. Oh. Uh, meeting chess. Oh, okay. All right. Um, can I ask? Yeah, let me unmute. Let me unmute in there, but it's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. Let, let me unmute. Thank you oh, very much. Oh, I see. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, Tulani. Thanks, Tulani. Please, please, please mute your mic. <laughs> um, I will. I will take Nyam Nyameko. Uh, Nyameko? Okay, Nyameko, let's try it again. Nyameko, can you unmute your mic? Hello, Nyameko? All right, um, while we wait for Nyameko, we'll apply the same principle with Tulani. Um, your opportunity is still available to unmute your mic. Um, so if you are able to unmute your mic at some point, um, you are more than welcome to indicate and to join. Um, I see the last hand um, is that of Mildred Mamakwa. Um, Okay, I've I've lost Mildred. Um, let me take the last hand, being that of um, Gabriel Tinene. Tinene Tinene Gabriel, you can unmute your mic. Hello. Yes, Doctor Musa, I'd like to know something. Yes. In a country which is embroiled with lots of um, crime, particularly robbery and hijacking, where a, a hijacker goes out hijacking, he knows that he might be faced with resistance from the person who's being hijacked. But he reconciles with the fact that, yes, if there is resistance, I'll deal with it. Goes with a gun, and um, the person who's being hijacked sort of comes out of the car, but then retaliates and fight back. And the fight ensues to the point that X shoots Y, who's the car owner. When it goes to court, will the situation be that X will be charged for hijacking? And in terms of murder, because he would have killed Y, will it be a dollars eventuals 
position or what? Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. That is a very, very good question. Um, yes, that will be dollars eventualis. In fact, the courts have went as far as to say that in the case of um, a group of people or a few individuals um, doing a robbery, um, if um, during the course of that robbery, um, they can, they, they, one of them or, or can foresee the possibility that um, in 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 pursuing their aim to to actually steal um, and to and to rob a store, there might be resistance, and in the process of that resistance, firearms would may be used, and they still proceed with that. Then that is dollars eventualis. So 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 there would be there would have been a foresight of the possibility of death occurring. Remember the definition of dollars eventualis. The main aim was the robbery. But in pursuing the robbery, they foresaw the possibility that uh, a death may result as a result of one of them using firearms. And they still continued reconciling themselves with that possibility. That is dollars eventualis. Intention is established. And the courts have even gone as far as to say, if a shootout takes place, and um, let's say in the course of the shootout, a security guard dies, but dies as a result of the shot fired by another security guard or a bystander instead of the robbers. That is something that was foreseen by um, the, the robbers, and they will be held to have had Dollars eventualis if charged with the murder of the security guard. Trust that helps. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, Christian Zungu. Christian Zungu, you can unmute your mic. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, sir. Uh, mine is not a question, it's just a concern. Uh, I'm looking at the high level of um, evangelism that we have in our country. Uh, it will never drop since we still have this case of Humphrey. I think they just need to 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 get rid of it straight. <laughs> well, um, remember, um, Chris, Christian, um, Humphreys only applies for road accident cases. Uh. So, 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 so it it is definitely limited in its um, relevance to the situation whereby uh, people die as a result of a road accident or a fatality a fatality happened. Uh, in the course of a road accident. Um, and as you can see, Humphreys was applied in Nancy. It was applied in Marohanye because all of those are instances of road accidents or fatalities that arose from road accidents and instances whereby the prosecution came with a charge of murder. But because mm. of Humphreys, because of Humphreys, um, they were eventually convicted of couple homicide. Mm. Okay, but even though they just need to remove it, man, because it, it's helping the criminals. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think it's a concern to um, to to the situation whereby you know it can potentially bring uh, the law into disrepute, especially if people. Um, do things uh, like speed racing and uh, yes. you know um, if you speed race and and in the speed race uh, one of one of the people are driving in the lane of oncoming traffic you, you can't mm. tell me that you don't see the possibility of of of, of, of you um, causing a potential accident you know 
um, mm. and that you can't reconcile yourself with that. It's it's just uh, problematic. And 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 even this is why I say go and read that case for yourselves, because mm. I even get a sense that the 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 the, the South Houting High Court um, was very conflicted. They 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 really. Be they, they 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 were conflicted because they were bound by Humphreys, mm. uh, and mm. and but but you can see even in the way that they are reasoning that it it, 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 it there's a struggle, you know, it, it, internal logic, you know, somewhere there it is a struggle. So so um yeah, it it remains to be seen how far Humphreys will go. Mm. All right, thanks, thanks, sir. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure. Let me take the final question um, to from um, Victor. Victor, you can unmute your mic. Hello, Victor. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Yeah, my question uh, it's related to possible neg medical negligence. I want to ask about the scenario where a patient uh, goes to the hospital and maybe from hospital A, then hospital A give you a prescription that you need to go to hospital B in order to get your proper medication. Now, hospital B does not want to give uh, you the proper medication prescribed by hospital A and for a prolonged period of time. And then should this patient dies, is there anyone that can be held liable, maybe in terms of culpable homicide? Will that be qualified as a culpable homicide in terms of the institution that refuses to give this patient medication? That's my question. Um, thank you, Victor, for that question. Um, that will definitely be an instance of medical uh, negligence. Um, but um, firstly, somebody would have to be charged with um, with culpable homicide or with murder, depending on what the prosecution decides. Um, and the elements would have to be proved. Um, was there an act on that person? Um, that did did the act comply with the defi definition elements for murder? In other words, did it cause the death of another human being? That would have to, you'd have to prove causation. Um, you'd have to prove unlawfulness as well. And you'd have to prove intention if it's murder or negligence if it's couple homicide. So um, that will that will depend on, on how the elements of liability are proved. Okay. Yeah, yeah. but in this case, it's not like, uh, um, it, it might not be a, a pers one person per se. But remember, in a hospital, it's got this, uh, you, you've got the complainant manager, you've got the CEO not, not wanting to act in some form or way that will assist the patient, and the patient ends up uh, uh, succumbing to the death. But right, the, patient, I, I... The, the, the CEO is not, a, is not a medical doctor who examined the patient, you know. But now the medical doctor says to you, look, I need one, two, three, but now the CEO does not want to release one, two, three. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't see that could as, as a, a murder as such, but I'm thinking of probably an element of negligence might be there. Yeah, if the, if the negligence is there, um, it will have to be established. Um, but then... Um, that would maybe count or contribute towards a claim for for damages or civil relief. Um, it would not fall under the criminal law. Oh, it will it will not fall under the criminal law. Yes. Okay. 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 All right. Thanks, Prof. No, it's a pleasure. Um, I would like to thank all the students who participated today. Thank you for sacrificing your holiday um, to be part of this. Um, if you have any questions on subject content, um, please feel free to engage on my UNISA discussion forum. 
Um, I check those as regularly as possible and answer particular queries as you go along. Um, and um, next week we'll be doing the, the, the second portion of intention, which is mistake. Um, have yourself a good youth day. Thank you. Can I just last, ask Thank one, you, last Prof. Question? one last clarification question? Thank okay. you, Prof. Yeah, one thank last you, clarification bro. question on the easy, Thank you, thank you, thank you, Prof. Early on the early learning uh, examiners, uh, exam question, exam, uh, exam. Yes. How do I see that uh, I'm one of those selected to write early exam? Um, the communication should come to you. Oh, the communication will come to me? Yeah. Okay, all right, no, thanks. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rapelang. Thank you, Ramos. Thank you, Prof.